Gabriel and Kosh again for this chance to spend time with you and study together and thank your community again for this a lot of work went into this um, weekend and uh, I, don't, I don't know about you but I've certainly enjoyed it I've found this to be a, such a warm and natural unaffected community it's a pleasure to be here you could almost be South Africans <laughs> So there's a subject that uh, my coach suggested that we speak about, which is very relevant to Adar and Purim, lofty heights, getting there, staying there. And I think that perhaps we can allow ourselves just a little insight into the Kabbalistic world. Is that, is that okay? Can we, can we do that? If you say I spoke about it, I can always deny it. I can say you did this, you manipulated this digitally. <laughs> but there is an idea that's written in the uh, central works of Kabbalah that is it's very hard to understand in its own terms. <clears throat> but like all Kabbalistic ideas, is a theme that runs through all of reality. After all, the mystical wisdom is the genetic level, if you like, of Torah. It's that hidden esoteric world from which everything else fans out. And therefore its ideas are extremely powerful. They may sound very abstract, but in fact they are the roots of all, <coughs> all reality. So let's allow ourselves, being that it's Rosh Chodesh Adar, an insight into that world. Let's study together an idea. I know it will sound very theoretical and abstract, but let's do that. And then let's see if we can feel it out into its applications. <coughs> so here's what's written. Is that and if you'd like to look this up, it's in the classic, it's in all the classic works, but it's put in something like these terms in the great work of the Arizal that was written in the 1500s. And he says something like this, that, and, and, and in Hasidic literature you'll find this brought out in many different ways, <coughs> that the world consists of light. The world is based on light. It's not for nothing that the Torah begins with a, the creation of light or the revelation of light. The meaning of that is that the world that we experience is only what we call a gilui. It's a revelation. <clears throat> what it is, we have no access to. All we, all we can ever make contact with is what that reality reveals. What the reality is, we don't know. We can only engage it with our senses. And light is really the medium of revelation. Without light, nothing is, nothing is seen. And for that reason, the Torah begins with the or let there be light. And of course, the Medrash says that <coughs> in the first couple of verses <coughs> of the Torah, the word light is mentioned five times, right? God said, let there be light. There was light. Hashem saw the light, etc. Five times it mentions light. And the, the matter says that each of these is the root of one of the five books of the, of the Torah. And from there is a whole wonderful derivation of how everything in the world has five levels. But this light that shines is the beginning of all that is revealed. And here's the secret. The light that shines always shines twice. The first time is perfect. It's perfect because the light has to be strong enough on its first shining to make possible all that will come later. Or the way it's put in those sources, <coughs> the light must be strong enough to open up a space for all things to exist in later. Not just to light up a darkness, but to even create the place where the darkness is in the first place. And that's called the first light. In Hasidic literature it's called the Or Rishon, the first light. And it is perfect, incredibly strong, but it's not destined to last. It's destined to be there only long enough, only long enough to open that space, and then it goes away. And it leaves a, a tremendous aching emptiness, a, a longing for the light that was once there. But it leaves a darkness. The, the longing and the, the absence of the light, the, the, the feeling of what was once there, brings in a second light. But the second light is very, very faint and almost nothing compared to the first. But it's the one that lasts. It's the one that the whole exercise was intended for. And although it's very small and only a faint echo of the first light, it is it's what remains. If you're interested in the details, just to fill out the details slightly more, the first light, when it goes away, it leaves something of a residue. 
something of a heaviness in the Kabbalistic terminology. It's called a Rashimu. That means an impression, sort of a, an afterglow. It's as if you just looked up as someone turned a corner and all you have is the, the, the image of, of their disappearance, let's say. And that residue of the first light is enough to keep the space open. Obviously, if the first light went completely, you'd be back to where you began. You wouldn't have achieved anything. And so this residue, or this heaviness as it's called, of the first light remains. It keeps the space open. And it, it remains in that space of darkness. And that shapeless <coughs> residue of the first light, when the second light comes in, finds that residue and enters it. And the second light becomes the soul, and the residue of the first light becomes the body. Now I'm sure you, you all feel much wiser, and I'm sure all your, all your life questions have been answered. But there's a very powerful idea. Actually, there are many, many paradoxes and mysteries here. One we're not going to deal with today, just a homework exercise. You see that the residue that forms the body derives from a higher source than the soul. Amazing thing, because it's a residue of the first life which is even higher than the second. There are many mysteries here, but, but the, well, that's what, did you say well? Yeah. yeah, that's a real well. And of course, that's the reason there can be a tchesamesim, a resurrection of the dead eventually, is because the body comes from a source at least as high as the soul, and that's why the body has an ongoing, the body has an ongoing existence, right? The two, are, the two are truly harmonized, they have a common source. Do you know what the Gemara says about that? The Gemara says that once Rebbe and Antoninus, you know, Rebbe was the great editor of the Mishnah, and Antoninus was the Roman emperor of the time, we know him as Marcus Aurelius, a very great man, they were very, very close friends. In fact, deeply they represent body and soul too. But on one occasion they had a debate about body and soul. Actually, the Talmud records some of their debates in which Rebbe actually agrees to the Roman opinion. Very interesting. But, and I'm showing you my Maral class, you've studied that and what that means. But on <coughs> one occasion, the body-soul debate took a following form. The Romans said to the rabbi, I will show you how after death you can exempt yourself from punishment. After death, when God tries to punish you, there's a very easy way to exempt yourself and escape all punishment. How can you do that? Because after death, death means a separation of body and soul. Death does not mean the death of the soul. The neshama can never die. It's an indestructible, eternal thing. Death means life is when the one is invested in the other. And death is a separation to some degree. A distraction of the soul from inside the body. So when a person is no longer alive, and the body is lying inanimate in the grave, and the soul is floating in the spiritual world, when God tries to punish you, so he'll try to punish this, the soul, the neshama. And the neshama will say, what do you want from me? I'm floating in the air like a bird. Had it not been for the body, I never would have sinned. The body is the place of all the problems, right? You see, I'm pure floating in there. So Hashem will try to punish the body, and the body will say, I'm just a lump of clay. What do you want from me? Say, I'm an inanimate lump of clay. Had it not been for the animating power of the soul, I never would have sinned. <laughs> And therefore, since each will blame the other, you'll be exempt from all punishment. <laughs> That's what you call a nice try. <laughs> so the rabbi answered as follows. Rabbi answered him as follows. And, and I, listen to the elegance of this answer. He said to him, and of course, since the Roman is representing the dis dichotomy between soul and body, between the inner and the outer world, yes, he's, he lives in that world of externality where the two can never be united. So the, rab the Rebbe answered him with a marshal, an analogy, which is an external version, right, of a truth. That's the right way to answer such questions. And he said to him, there was once a king who had an orchard of beautiful fruit. And he put two guards into the orchard to guard the fruit. One of the guards was lame, and one was blind. Right? And he told them to guard the fruit. When the king left, they decided to eat all the fruit and betray their, their toes. So what happened was the lame man climbed on the shoulders of the blind man, and using his ability to walk and his ability to see, they walked around the orchard and ate all the fruit. When they were lying on the grass full of fruit and there was nothing left, the king arrived, saw that all the fruit had been stolen, <coughs> realized what had happened, took a stick, was about to beat the lame man for having stolen the fruit. The lame man said to the king, it couldn't have been me, I, I can't walk. You had it not been for his legs, we never could have done this. So the king went to the blind man, it's about beating him, and the blind man said to the king, I can't see. Had it not been for his eyes, we never could have done this. What did the king do? He picked up the layman, put him back on the shoulders of the blind man, and beat them together. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ramchal explains what this really means is, of course, although the word doesn't explain it, since this, the, the crime was committed as a partnership, the reward or recompense or retribution must be meted out to the partnership. And what's meant is that you live through your life as partners in crime. 
There's your soul and your body. Each one uses the other in a partnership. You achieve everything you achieve in the world as a partnership of body and soul. And therefore, the final reality of reward will be body and soul together. And that's why it's so deeply axiomatic in Judaism that the resurrection of the dead will be the final situation <coughs> where body and soul <coughs> function together. Permanently. There's a debate among early authorities. The Rambam makes it sound like there will be no body and all the others just a soul dimension. But it's very clear that what he really means is that there will be a body, but that body will be so elevated it's hard to call it a body. But there will always be lights and vessels, <coughs> always this body. And that is the story of the two lights, the one that is very, very strong, that goes away, leaves the residue, and, 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 and <coughs> emptiness, and then the second light comes in, which is very, very faint, according to the Kabbalistic description, instead of being a light that fills all space, it's only a thin beam, just thin enough to exist, just big enough to be there, and small enough not to completely reverse the darkness. Those are the two lights. What does this mean? So, when you look at all life experience, you will see there are always two stages like this. There are always two phases. <coughs> there are always two, two versions of reality. The first is always perfect. It's indestructible. And it's, it's an ideal. But after that, the ideal is taken away. And what it leaves is an emptiness and a pain, but a knowledge of what was once, and a longing and a knowledge of a possibility. In, 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 in philosophical terms, we would say that before a thing can be, its possibility must exist. First, the po first must become possible. The first light opens up the envelope of all possibilities. Or the way our, our Jewish sources put it, before, thing, before a thing can exist, it must have a place. A thing can't exist unless there's a place for it. By the way, this is, where, this is why Hashem is called the place of the world. <coughs> right. Hashem is called Makayim Shalaylam. He's called Makon. One of the names of God is the place. A very strange name, right? We say Baruch Hamakom. Hashem is called the place of the world because He is. You know that if you take Hashem's name Yud Kei Vav Kei, and you multiply each letter by itself, right? You get the same numerical value as the word place, Makom. Mm. Right? Yud Kei Vav Kei, ten times ten, five times five, etc. So that comes up to the same as Makom, which is 186. What does that mean? What does it mean when you take a word in Hebrew and multiply each letter by itself? What you're doing is you're expressing all facets and possibilities of the thing. The four letters are simply the S's. But when you let it run its program, so to speak, you let it express itself fully, then you get the full expression. What is that? The place of the world. Hashem's name is the essence of being. But when it does what it does, you have the place of the world, right? Everything exists. That's why the Talmud says he is not in the world. The world is in him. He is the place of the world. I think, I'm not sure, I haven't heard this from anyone, you stuck with my own interpretation, it could be wrong, but I think that's why when we greet a mourner, we say, we say, may Hashem comfort you, but very unusually we use the word, may the place of all reality, it's a very strange thing, you'd expect us to say Hashem, Hashem's name of kindness, mercy, right, for a comforting mourner, we don't, we don't do that, we say, that means may the Hashem, who is the place of the place of all that exists. I think the reason for that, if I, I think the reason maybe, is because what's happened is the person who's left this world is now in a different place, behind a, behind a partition. And what we say to this morning is, but in the largest sense of space and place, they still exist. They've just moved into a different room. But the comfort is that there's still a larger dimension in which, which we still share, and of course will only take the removal of that partition eventually to re-establish that relationship. But, that is the idea. And so everywhere you look, you'll see that there's a first ideal level of experience, and then that goes away. And the second is nothing compared to the first, <coughs> but it's the one that's meaningful. It's the one that is the, one that is the purpose of the exercise. Let's take a few examples, and I, I hope this will become plain. Let's look at, let's take a communal, let's take a national example, and then let's take personal examples. <coughs> take a national example. How are the Jewish people formed? You know, Purim, we're coming up to Purim. Purim is the second version of Pesach, right? Pesach was the time when the Jewish people were formed, accepted the Torah, established a relationship with Hashem. But the Gemara says that Purim was the real fulfillment of that relationship. Pesach was, if you like, a first light experience. The Jews, the Torah was given in a blaze of miracles. You'd have to be blind not to see. Tremendous, tremendously powerful revelation. But, but Purim, where Hashem manifests behind the mask, Purim is all about masks and hiddenness. Esther means the hidden one. 
then the Jews perceive and choose to perceive where it's not essential, where it's not, it's not inevitable, it's not forced on you, and that is our greatness. So these are the two, the two ends of Jewish history. So let's speak about them. The first, the first experience, Pesach, <coughs> Jewish people began, be, are formed as a nation. You see that it has exactly these two phases. The Jewish people leave Egypt in a blaze of miracles. Right? It couldn't be higher than that. There's a tremendous... No work has been done. They haven't deserved that. And they're elevated one step after another into a tremendous spiritual... A crescendo of spiritual re re revelation. You know that the Maral points out that the plagues in Egypt were not simply a sequence. They were a rising... Yeah, a, a climate. They reached a climax. Each plague was higher than the one before. That incredible midnight when the firstborn of the Egyptians were destroyed and the Jewish people became, so to speak, that firstborn, was a, was a, was a crescendo of spiritual experience that's indescribable. There are many ways to put this, but one, one particularly beautiful way to put it is this. The Maral points out that the plagues in Egypt proceeded in reverse order of the sayings of creation. You know the Torah is full of tens, right? You don't need me to tell you that. The Torah manifests tens every place, right? There are ten sayings of creation, ten plagues in Egypt, ten ordeals in the desert. Abraham, Abraham Avinu was put through ten tests, the ten commandments. Obviously, they all parallel each other. So the morale points out that the plagues in Egypt proceeded in reverse order of the sayings of creation. Right? What does that mean? The world is created in ten steps. The first is called the Bereshit in the beginning, which is just a dimensionless statement of beginning. Then there's a revelation of that that's called the Hero Let There Be Light. And Kabbalistically, you are building ten layers, ten shells, ten, ten spheres, right, around that dimensionless point. The Egyptians had so contaminated reality, it was such a depraved place, such a corrupt place, that each plague was an object lesson in purification. Each plague in Egypt was a knocking out of one of the levels of contamination that the Egyptians had put into reality. So if you begin from a dimensionless point and you build ten layers, they're like an onion ri rings. When you purify such a process, you must peel the layers away from the outside till you get back to a pure center. So the process is reversed. What is the first saying of creation? Pure beginning, in the beginning, gracious, right? A pure beginning. What was the last of the ten plagues? Destruction of the Egyptian? Firstborn. That means the destruction and the killing of the wrong sort of firstness. Right? The wrong type of beginning. You know that the Egyptians, every home it says, had a firstborn that was destroyed. In every Egyptian home, the firstborn died. But in no home was it the firstborn that people thought was the firstborn. They were so immoral that what this husband thought was his firstborn by his wife was somebody else's. And only then was it revealed too really. It was a terribly, terribly immoral place. So what happened was the beginning of creation is in the beginning, and the last of the plagues, working backwards, is the wrong sort of be destruction of the wrong. The second saying of creation, let there be light. The second last of the plagues, darkness. darkness. You see a very beautiful working... Look it up yourself, it's in chapter 57 of the Sefer Akburis, very beautiful sequence of reversal that the morale shows. But what I want to bring out from it for tonight is this, that since it's a reversal, it means that you are going through the plagues, getting higher and higher, you're reaching back to the moment of creation. And on that moment of the firstborn's destruction, you've got back to the voltage of the moment when the world was created. In fact, that moment is so powerful, it isn't even a statement, it isn't even let there be, it's simply Hashem, God's being, right? What do we say in the Haggadah every year? We say by all the plagues, they were affected through the normal mechanism, angelic powers. Uh, the tenth plague, Ani velo malach, Ani velo saraf, Ani velo shleach. The tenth plague, God says, I didn't do it through any agency, I simply appeared. The Kabbalists explain that the reason the firstborn died was not because God killed him, he just appeared. The sanctity of such an appearance just wiped out anything that was improper and, right, and, and a contradiction to that level of purity. So that you have the Jewish people going through an ascent, and the tenth of the plagues is an indescribable voltage where they actually experience the passing over of Hashem Himself. And then what happens? Seven days later, they take it to something even higher when the sea splits, and then the surprise occurs. At that moment of incredible elevation, they dropped in the desert. And a desert is always a place of death forces. A desert always means, in literal terms, a desert is a place of no life and no water. But in total, always you're reading on a higher plane. A desert means a zone of death energies where there's no spiritual life. And then the trouble begins. Then they have to walk through day after day, one step at a time to reach Sinai. And the message is, <coughs> first it's all done for you. First the Jewish people are uplifted beyond description. And when they get the message and absorb that power, Hashem says, now it's one step after another through the desert. And the desert is a terrible place. I mean, over the next 38 years in the desert, they faced 10 ordeals and failed all of them. That's where all the death forces in the world are raised against them. So what's the, what is the, what's the picture? The picture is, <coughs> first, a tremendous uplift for free. 
And at the moment when it appears it'll last forever, Hashem steps back and says, no, no, you do it. Now there's no rocketing up to a pinnacle. Now it's one painful step after another. The word Pesach means to leap over. In Hebrew, leap soach means to leap over. Pesach means a leaping to the 50th level in one go, which is totally unnatural. But then you have to, then you have to pay. This is called fly now, pay later. <laughs> <laughs> Hashem leaps you up to 50 level. You can have whatever you want on that first night. It's called a lel shiru. You don't have to lock the doors. It's a total miraculous night. And then you have to pay for it. Then it's a painful process of one step after another to earn and lock in and acquire and deserve what it is that's been given for free. And that's a picture of life. That's the pattern of life. You see it in so many ways. The month of going out of Egypt is called Nisan. Nisan, right? The month of Nisan means the miraculous. Nisan is Gematria Nisim. It means the miraculous month. Any, any astrologers here? What is the zodiac of the month of Nisan? The sheep. The sheep is an animal that's passively led. It doesn't have any of its own strength. It just follows. The next month in the desert, which is a dangerous and difficult time, here, the zodiac is the, the bull. The bull is totally opposite animal. It doesn't follow at all. It has, has, develops its own willful strength. And the third month, where the two energies harmonize, is the month of... <coughs> the twins. Twins, Gemini. To Omim, right? Sivan is the perfect, harmonious coming together of what was once given for free and then taken away and you had to supply yourself. It's that relationship of master and disciple. That's why the third month of Gemini, to Omim, is the giving of the Torah. It's the two tablets. It's Moshe and Aaron. It's As and Hashem. It's the oral and the written law. It's all the dualities coming together in perfect harmony. And that's the pattern. First Hashem does it and lifts you to that level, and then he steps back and says, get the message, now you do it. Then you walk through the desert, and then you reach a, 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 a relationship of equals. First it's done for you, and you need that, right? But then you have to do it on your own. It's when the father teaches his child to walk, he picks up a little baby by the hands, and the child stands on his feet, what an exhilarating moment. He's standing there, he takes his first step, and he can't fall, because Abba's holding his hands. And as he feels the exhilaration of that moment, that's when Abba lets go. And then he stands there terrified and alone and abandoned by the one who put him in that situation. And that's when he learns to walk. And only after he takes that first frightened step on his own does he realize that the moment... Then he can rush into his father's arms and realize that the moment when his father left go was being shown a deeper love than the moment when he held his hands. And that's the pattern. It's always like that. And all life experiences like that. Who taught you to ride a bicycle? Your dad. How did he do it? He ran along next to you holding the saddle. Whoa, what an amazing moment. And then you look back. Ah! He wasn't there, right? But that's when you learned to ride. That's when you learned to ride, right? But you couldn't have done it hadn't he got you there in the first place. Right? You never would have gotten there yourself. And that's the pattern of life. And most people tragically give up when they look back and they see there's no one there. Then they think he got it wrong. He got the wrong address. Why me? But that's the way it's designed. It's designed like that. First, first it begins with an incredible thrill. And a, and, a, and a free ride, if you like, and then it gets taken away. That's the idea. That's how life is. The first light shines to make it possible. And once all the possibilities have been created, then you have to step in and do it. The purpose of being here is to actually create it yourself. That's the whole reason we have free will, and that's why we're faced with ordeals. As Rabbi Tversky, he was in town earlier this week. Rabbi Tversky puts it beautifully. It says, when God created the human being, it said, he said, Na'aseh Adam. Let us make man. That's a tremendously problematic statement. Let us make man. I mean, if there's one thing we fixated on in Judaism, it's God's oneness. So who's the us? <coughs> there are many incredible answers. But the one he likes to give is, let us make man means me and you. Me and, and you. Who's going to make you? Me and you. I'm going to give you all the possibilities and set you up, and then you're going to do it. You're going to make you. Right? So that's what it means. It means you, we are the creator of our own. And that's tough. That's tough. So that's how it's formed. That's how you see the Jewish people formed in that. In that uh, and wherever you look, you'll see that when, when man and woman were created originally, they were given everything in a garden of perfection. It doesn't get better than that. They were lifted into a garden. There was almost nothing left to do. And it crashed. Without going into the details, it crashed. And then they have to walk through the desert of life's experience. And they can't go back to the garden. You never can go back. The only way you can go back to the garden is the long way around. Now the, Mara, the, the Rambam puts it like this. He says, when they were exiled from the God, they failed. They failed and they were banished. As they found themselves in that desolate world outside the God, why didn't they go back in? Turn, turn, go back to the gates. Hashem wouldn't allow them to go back to the gates. The Torah says he placed angels standing at the gates with the blades of a flashing sword. The blade of the sword that turns and flashes and turns. What is this lethal weapon that turns and turns and turns? 
Another example is people who learn Torah have the incredible experience that we call a chidush. A chidush in Torah. You're sitting and learning some Torah and suddenly you have an original idea. An original Torah idea. And if you do it well and often, you can write a whole book of your original ideas. How can you do that? What a chutzpah. What a chutzpah. Torah comes from Hashem. Don't make it up. The answer is you're not making it up. You're dipping a bucket into the deep well of that primal, original knowledge and you're bringing it out. The learning of Torah is simply setting up a, 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 a resonance. With, with what your own innate wisdom is, and of course you, you bring it out from yourself. It's not, it's not something you're making up, it's something that you, 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 you're drawing out. Right? And that is because it was once an innate, and this isn't only Jewish, of course, this is human. I mean, the, the Greeks proved this, right? The Greeks, in the, in the Socratic discussion, there's an example of a, of a slave boy that the philosopher, example that they, you know, he showed him Pythagoras' theory, and it's a slave boy, never learned anything, and he got it. He said, well, how would he get it unless he had, how did he recognize it unless he had the innate, the innate, the innate wisdom, a child, the skill of a teacher is to bring it all out. But children are small, that's easy to do this, you know, it's, one, one person said that children become great because of their elementary school teachers and despite their high school teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to any high school teachers. If you give eight to nine year old and ten year old kids a piece of paper and you ask them to write down everything that's good about them, they never have enough paper. <laughs> if you ask fifteen year olds to write what's good about them, they sit there with a blank piece of paper, <laughs> convinced that everybody else is writing long lists, they can't think of anything good about this. Somehow by age fifteen we managed to beat out of them all. <laughs> But real education brings it out. And therefore, and that's the meaning, the child is given it all, there's a light lit about his head, he has everything. And that's why you have a potential sense of inspiration. Because it is there. Take another example. When a child's born, that's before birth, and all, but take life from birth on. There are two phases. There's the childhood phase, childhood or children and teenagers, and then there's the rest of life. The natural mode of a child and a young teenager is inspiration. Hashem gives children and teenagers a sense of tremendous... He doesn't give them responsibility. They don't have responsibility. They're taken care of. And they have a tremendous... The normal mode for a child is to think that everything's possible. To see all possibilities. Take a normal five-year-old and ask him what he's going to be when he grows up. He'll tell you the most impossible combination of... Because he's going to be an astronaut, garbage can, garbage truck driver, underwater policeman. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what my one said. When he was, my son was six. That's what he wanted to be like. You know, no problem. Because children have this expanded sense of possibilities. They don't see the world closing in on them. Every 18-year-old young man in, in Western society, if you scratch beneath the surface, you'll see he's totally convinced he's going to be the world's greatest everything. Intellect, movie star, womanizer, financial genius, <laughs> athlete. No question. But when he's 28 and 38 and 48 and 58, and he's not the world's greatest anything. So then some men get morbidly depressed, but most keep right on fantasizing that they are the world's greatest. <laughs> <laughs> they just haven't had time to. <laughs> or either that or the wife won't let them. <laughs> It's her fault, you know. But um, that's natural. That's natural. Many people say, you know, when I was 18, I could laugh so richly and cry so... Yeah, such, and now something's died. That's right. It's designed that way. When you're 18, or when you're 8 or 18, <coughs> there's a tremendous sense of inspiration that's given to you as a tool. The mitzvah for a child. And what parents have to provide the children with the opportunities to flex their muscles and spread their wings and find all their talents and all their abilities. That's what child is for. And then comes the painful phase of closing it down and closing the circle and, and, and focusing on the limited because the limited is all you can do. But it begins with unlimited. It begins with this, the, the, the light. The first light is unlimited light. And in the child's experience, the first light is, is, is the conviction that they can do anything. And then slowly it gets taken away. Because it, uh, the primal human consciousness is tremendous greatness. Each human being knows that they are the best in the world at something and they need it. You know where we see this? You know, we just read that the Marxists are shekel. That every Jew had to give a half a shekel. There are many wonderful things that have been said about why it's half a shekel. 
But you know what's fascinating is the Torah says very specifically that every Jew has to give a half a shekel, and no one's allowed to give more, no one's allowed to give less. The rich may not give more, and the poor may not give less. What does that mean? One of the meanings is because each person is equally essential. It doesn't matter whether you're the bottom of the feet or the top of the head, or you're this brick in the building, or you're that. It make any difference. It's all necessary. Electric circuit, every little piece is necessary. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a little piece of wire. It could be the, each piece. You pull one piece out, the whole thing doesn't operate. That's why I say for Torah, if it has one, one letter, say for Torah, missing or, bra- or broken, the whole thing's invalid. So everybody has to give only a half, because you're not only a, p- a part. Without a- a- everyone else, there's no complete piece here. But each piece is equally necessary, right? And the word Yisrael spells Yesh Shishim Ribo Otiot La Torah. It's an acronym for there are 600,000 letters in the Torah. That's what the word, the word Israel, the Jewish people, it's an acronym for there are 600, because each Jew is a letter in the Torah. And with one letter missing, the whole thing's invalid. With one person, and therefore each person feels that they swell to the proportions. They have all that potential within them. They know that the whole thing that needs me. You know what's very interesting is that psychologically, everyone needs, the old Balai Musi used to say that every person needs to know that they're the best in the world at something and totally essential at that thing. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be the most, the most you know, the, the weird talent. Balancing a bottle on your nose better than anybody else. It doesn't matter. As long as you can do something in the world that no one else can do as well as you and you are needed for that. And you know what happens when people lose that? When people lose all self-respect and they suddenly realize I'm not needed for anything? The old Balai Musa used to say that one or two things happen. Either a person dies, or they, go, they become insane. And when people like that snap and become insane, they become very important. Very important. I spent long years in psychiatric hospitals. And you always interview the people, who are you? Napoleon, Caesar. <laughs> Isn't it? Always somebody very important. That's an amazing thing. I was once interviewing a patient. I said to him, who are you? Napoleon. I said to him, who told you that? He said, God. The guy in the next bed said, I did not. <laughs> that's, very, that's very revealing. It's a self-defense mechanism. When a person has nothing left, suddenly they don't become nothing, they become everything. But it comes from a deep truth. We are very important. We are messianic and, and, and world empire leaders. Because we all need it. each piece of the... So there is that. And the hard thing is when you have to admit, well, I'm not all of it, I'm only an essential. The Bible must say you have the two pieces of paper in your pockets at all times. On one should be written, the world was created for me, and on one should be written, I'm nothing. That's true. Muslim means I'm nothing, because I'm ridiculous in my smallness. On the other hand, I'm part of the circuit. Without me, the lights don't come on. Right? That is the, that's the correct vision. So it starts off with that sense of totality. And then it becomes a very difficult process where each step has to be put into place and it's a very small and frustrating, but that's... And you see the transition, it's very interesting when you see a young child suddenly realizes, they start growing into the age where they realize they can't do it all. It's like when I was walking to shul with my, one of my young son when he was six years old. He walking Friday afternoon, he falls silent for a couple of minutes, which usually means he has a fever, you know, some, some <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, After two minutes of silence, he says to me, you know, Abba, I'm very worried because I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to marry Debbie or Frida. <laughs> so I said to him, what's the problem? He said, because whichever one I marry, the other one's going to be so upset. <laughs> okay. So when we finally get to show walk up the steps, he stops dead on the top step and he says to me, you know, I just realized whoever I marry, all the others are going to be so upset. <laughs> <laughs> he's a confident young man, you see, because, but for the first time in his life he starts to realize, can't do it all. And sometimes you find a young man who's a bit hesitant to get married. If you scratch beneath the surface, you'll find it's because he looks out at the world of women. There are millions out there. Each one's more beautiful than the next. And he's getting married, he'll have only one. The childhood phase is rather to live in the fantasy of all and have none. <coughs> Maturity means closing the circle down and doing what you can do, but it's painful. That. It's painful. It's, it's, it's so small. It's just one. It's just... That's the difficulty. But it's always like that. The first phase is tremendously inspired because it's everything. But it's unrealistic. It's only potential. The second stage is, is very thin. It's a very thin pencil of light. But it's the one that is you, and it's the one that must be. If you want to refer to the Kabbalistic take on this, they always point out that the first phase is male. The second phase is female. 
Male always means inspiration and potential. Like the beginning of conception of a child. It's just a genetic gift, that's all. But the whole process and the building and the making specific is female. The Hebrew word for feminine, nekeva, means to make specific. The Hebrew word nekeva, female, means to make specific. Right? Like when Laban said to Yaakov, nakva schachanaibet, fix your wages and I'll pay you. Give me a figure. You see, if a person says to you, imagine a person walks up to you and says, money is no object. <coughs> Say any number, I give you that many dollars. Say any number. <coughs> <laughs> Until you say a number, you get nothing. As soon as you say a number, two things happen. One, you get the money. Two, not one cent more. To, for a thing to be in the world, it has to be limited. It has to be specified. Maleness means seed energy. Maleness means potential. We, we refer to Hashem as male because He's endless potential. The world is always feminine. The world is limited, but it's real. Right? The ma maleness is the potential. Potential could be anything. That's why it's so thrilling. <coughs> and that's why it's so... Irrelevant. When you wake in the morning and you could, what, what could you do today? Well, there's millions of possibilities. But only one of those can you do. Maleness is the thrill of ooh, all the things you could do. Femaleness is the closing down to the thing that is done. So on the one hand, it's very painful. It's very, it's very, it, it's limited. On the other hand, it, it's alive. It is, it's real. <coughs> Those are the two phases. It's always that relationship. The first is an infinite light. It's endless. It's a first light. There's no limitations. It's all possibilities. But in a real world, each of us can only do some of those. No? You have to discover which one it is. And so wherever look, you look, you'll find the same thing. And all human experiences, like friendships, I mean relationships, it's always thrilling in the beginning. And then it becomes mundane, then it becomes hard work to build. The body's built that way. The human body's built that way. All the nervous system of the human body <coughs> feels things only initially. First you feel something, and then it fades. In neurology, it's called accommodation. You accommodate to the feeling. You walk into a place where you smell, it strikes you. If you live there for a while, you can't smell it anymore. You live in a place where there's noise, right? Eventually, you don't. Somebody walks in and says, how can you work in noise like this? And you say, what noise? Suddenly, when it stops, you realize something's happening. But you only realize things. You only, you only sense a thing when it's sharp in the beginning. After that, it fades into unconsciousness. The body's built that way. In the neurology manuals, they always draw a graph. You know, there's a spike of awareness, and then it gradually fades out. You can't feel anything anymore. That's how we built. We built that way. There's a first light of awareness. And then the second light. And that's the, that's the picture. And wherever you look, I mean, the, the example we have to mention, I, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure it's completely irrelevant in Chicago. But marriage. Marriage has two phases. I'm sure in Chicago it's all first phase. So it's all <laughs> but marriage has two phases. Marriage has two phases. The first, in Western society, we call the first phase romance. Romans in Hebrew there isn't even a word for that. Because the first phase is it's not it doesn't last. There's no Hebrew word for romance. Just like there's no Hebrew word for all things that are essentially illusory. What? Essentially what? Illusory. 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 What is romance? You're sitting in this room, this person walks in, suddenly you look at her and bells start ringing someplace, music wafts in from another direction, <laughs> things get rosy and sort of hazy, get the tight chest what what what, what is that? After you get married, about two and a half hours after you get married, <laughs> there's no bells ringing, you know, because <clears throat> a young man says to me, Rabbi, I married the wrong girl. I say, how long have you been married? Two and a half months. Why is she the wrong girl? He said, because when I used to look at her in the beginning, I couldn't breathe. Now, two and a half months later, breathing fine. <laughs> I'd explain to this young fellow that two and a half months after marriage you're having trouble breathing. You've got asthma, you know, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> because there's only a possibility of that exhilaration in the beginning of an experience. It's, that, that's, that's where, of course, our tragedy is our children are brought up in a world of pure first phase experience. But they're not told that. They build a romantic picture and they label it love. Love is not a first phase experience. Love is only after much giving. Rabbi Desla famously explains, you love what you give, not what you get. That's a tragic mistake in Western society. People think when somebody makes you feel good, you love them. When somebody makes you feel good, it makes you love you, not them. That's like saying, I love fish. <laughs> when you love the fish, you're going to kill it, and grill it, and dismember it, and eat it, and you say you love it. If you love the fish, you put it back in the water and then it's back to its mother. <laughs> You don't mean you love a fish, you mean you love you. And therefore real love 
The Hebrew word ahava is based on hav, which means to give. You love what you give. And when you give yourself, of course, that's why parents always love their children more than the children love their parents. Always. Your parents are always loving their children more than the children love their parents because the giving goes in that direction. Their life is good. <coughs> My dad used to give the famous example of a family that was separated during the war. Right? The father was taken to the Russian side and the mother was taken to the German side with the children. And the father, after the war, had to admit that the children that he was separated from, he never was able to feel as close to because he was deprived of years of giving to those children. It's the giving that generates love. And therefore, you can't talk about the Western society's biggest paradox, his biggest... Mm, um, what do you call it? The biggest um, illusion is love at first sight. You can't have love at first sight. You can have infatuation at first sight. You can have romance. You can't have love at first sight. You have to give to generate love. 35 years of giving to the same person, you can talk about love. But that's a second phase experience. It's a much deeper thrill. It's a much more meaningful thing. But it comes with, with long, tenacious, consistent giving. As I always say, the kids today have computers, right? Computers are a disaster. It's instantaneous. If a child has a computer, he has to plant a garden. Because he has to tend the seed week after week after week to get something to grow, he might learn about life. And therefore, and therefore, wherever you look, that is the that's the pattern. Let's let's finish by spending a few minutes on understanding for him. Jewish history has two phases. Jewish history has the first phase of illumination. And the second phase of darkness, right? If you take the span of Jewish history, you have 6,000 years of Jewish history. We are here, 5771, very close to the end. You go back 2,350 years, you get to Purim. And the, 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 defining, the defining characteristic of Purim is that before that, the world was luminous with revelation. There was prophecy and miracles. The Torah was being given, Hashem was appearing. And after Purim, just between Purim and Hanukkah, which was only about 150 years later, the lights went up. Puri is the last time anything was ever revealed. The last miracle that we ever had was Puri. The Hanukkah miracle was a very, very... The last thing that was ever written was Puri. The Megiddo of Puri is, is a story of miracles, but it's a very hidden miracle. It's a political series of events. You don't have, not forced to see the miracle. Hashem's name doesn't appear. Puri means the luck of the draw. Puri means a Persian word, not even a Hebrew word. Puri means a lottery, happenstance, coincidence. The battle was against Amalek. Amalek in Hebrew has the same numerical value as the word suffix, meaning a doubt. Nothing's clear. Amalek's force is, well, maybe God exists, maybe he doesn't, it's all accident, it's co coincidence. Maybe you're meaningful, maybe you're not, maybe you're human, maybe you're an advanced orangutan. <coughs> that's, the, that's the power of doubt. The Hebrew word suffix means doubt. The root of the word is suff, it means to stand on the edge of. Because you never enter the experience. You, like a person at a crossroads, which way to go? So you don't go either way. Right? You stand on the edge of the experience. You're not, you're not in it. And therefore, Esther means to hide. Of course, she's a woman because it introduces the difficult female phase. Up to then, the world is luminous with revelation. Everything's obvious. Hashem's giving the Torah. You have no free choice not to accept it. It's held over your head. And then you get to Purim. There's no force at all. From Purim on, from Purim on it's all... A matter of faith, it's all your ability to see in the darkness. It's walking through the night after the lightning has ceased. That's why we wear masks on Purim, where the world becomes a hidden, a hidden affair. Until then, Hashem is no mask. He's revealed. From Purim on, it's all a mask business. The world looks like a random, chaotic mess. We look like evolved animals. We certainly look like that. There's no question. Look at the human being. You see that at first. And therefore, that's a second phase experience. The first phase... You know, there's so many applications. Let, let me, maybe we'll finish with this. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you one. Knowing this is critical. There's, there's a phase of history that's revealed, and then there's a phase of history that's hidden. <coughs> Here's an example. Example. You know that one of the most uh, um, uh, common, or one of the most hot top, the hottest topics today in intellectual debate is the debate between religion and science. Right? You can't miss that. I mean. <laughs> What's fascinating is whenever you look at those debates, you'll find that people arguing are usually extremely well qualified scientifically and almost have, almost have no religious qualification at all. Right? 
I mean, Time Magazine, a few, a couple of years ago, ran a debate between Dawkins, who's a violently atheistic evolutionist, eminently qualified in biology, and a, pro a Professor Collins, who's a very religious Protestant Christian, who's a geneticist. Both of them are like world famous authorities in their field. Neither one has any religious knowledge. Why? Because in the non, in the in the, in the secular world out there, in the culture we live in, religion is a sort of a warm fuzzy feeling. It's not a not something you have to know. It's kind of personal feeling. Okay? And therefore, you can say whatever you like about it because it's not something you have to know. Completely contrary to the Jewish view. But that's how you get these very weird paradoxes. So, one that I would like to mention is there was a very famous astronomer. Famous astronomer. Not only famous in astronomy, but also the, the public dissemination. He was a brilliant teacher. He made uh, documentaries <coughs> of the universe. Uh, famous, he's no longer alive, he was a good guy. He was a very famously an atheist. So one day someone asked him, they interviewed him, why are you an atheist? You see the incredible wonders of the universe. What makes you an atheist? Listen to his answers, very interesting. He said, because there are two parallel systems. There's the world and the Bible. God is everywhere in the Bible and nowhere in the world. One of them's got to be a fake. What he meant was, the Jewish claim is that the Bible, the Torah, projects itself into reality. And every detail in the Torah must be found in the world. Wherever you look in the Bible, you find God. Either miracles or openly revealing himself or speaking to prophets. So I take that as the, mo the model, the map of the territory. I look at the territory and I don't find God anywhere. Nowhere in the universe have I seen any evidence of God. Either he's speaking to me, I've never seen a miracle, there's no evidence at all. Well, what am I supposed to trust? I trust my senses, what else can I do? The book must be a fake. That's an interesting challenge, isn't it? You know, that's what comes of speaking about religion when you know nothing about it. About 10 years ago, there was a debate arranged between some rabbis and some scientists. Right? A debate, religion against science. And on this occasion, they chose some people who didn't know about religion. One is a very um, dry, is an Englishman with a dry, rabbi, Refson, got a very dry sense of humor. And he knows his stuff. So the debate went like this. The first speaker was a world-famous astrophysicist, unfortunately Jewish, who is a very, very famous figure in astrophysics, very atheistic, whose great-grandfather wrote a Talmudic dictionary. <laughs> but he's a very atheistic fellow. Okay, he was the first to speak. So he got up and said like this. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know much about religion. Imagine the beginning of a debate that way. You're not going to debate a subject from the highest academic level. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know much about religion. But I think it can be summed up as, do unto others what you'd have them do unto you. And on that premise, he gave his talk. Rabbi Repson was the next speaker. He got up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know much about astrophysics. But I think it can be summed up as twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> if you have a primitive knowledge of the subject, you know. so here's this world famous astronomer saying that he's examined the Bible. I'm almost certain he couldn't even read it in its original. And God is everywhere. I look at the universe, God is nowhere. What he doesn't know is the Bible is written until 2,300 years ago. That's where it ceases to be written. The last book is virtually Esther. Esther, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Malachi was the last prophet who was Ezra. Ezra lived just after Esther. So you're talking about Esther as the closing out of prophecy. The Bible, as we know it, was written until then. God was speaking openly in the world and revealing himself. When you looked in, when the Bible was being written, disclosing God's presence, the world was luminous with prophecy and events. Then the Bible comes to a close, grinds to a halt at Purim. Where Purim is written, but it's very, very hidden type of a document. And after that, there's nothing at all. And he lives deep in the dark phase of history, where God is no longer revealed. And, and, and there's, no, there's no open perception of him. And of course, he doesn't see him in the world. If you know, you know, had he spent two months in the yeshiva, he would have known that Tanakh, right, the written aspect of the, of the Torah, the Bible that he's referring to, is a description of the world up to that point in history. It's documenting events as they occur. And then the last <coughs> prophet signs off. Right, Malachi, the last words of Malachi are, don't forget the Torah of Moses, that's the last line, right, because you're not going to see me again, and then we move into the darkness. And therefore it's absolutely critical to know that the world has two phases. There's a phase of inspiration, and that's where it's all given for free. And then there's a phase of darkness where, you, without being shown the light, you're going to have to perceive it yourself. But it's very, very faint. And that, of course, is our credit. And our sages are used to calling this the phase of the written law, and this is the phase of the oral law. The face of the written law is where Hashem is writing it and is dictating it and it's open. 
but it's only to set up the voltage and give us the charge that is needed to go through the desert of life's experience, which is the post-prophetic era where nothing is revealed and we have to do it ourselves and perceive it ourselves without any help. And therefore, Purim is the time for learning to see through the mask and not to be dismayed or put off by the fact that it's no longer obvious. That is our greatness, right? Now we're taking those painful steps through the desert, moving on the memory of the light that we once saw. Let me thank you again for this opportunity. a miracle that's not an open miracle. Political events. There was a king, couldn't sleep, he had a queen, no one knew she was. There was Haman who hated Jews, wanted to kill them all, perfectly natural, happens every generation. Right? A sequence of political events that led from a decree of destruction to salvation, but there was no ocean splitting, dead being revived, none of that. Esther means the hidden one. So the whole, not only that, the Talmud has a debate about whether the, the will of Esther is a prophetic book or not. Maybe it's not, maybe it's a historical documentation. As to Marshall proofs that it's a prophetic thing. Now, no, it look like that in the, in the Torah. So you see many, many indications of the fact that the light is fading. And right after that is Hanukkah. There's nothing written at all. Hanukkah doesn't even have a mission. Right? There's no revelation at all there. And it's very clearly a fading out of the light. Megiddo actually means, yeah. What is being Megala to us on the events in the Middle East today as we approach the final stage of the Mashiach? We see the events in the Middle East there changing rapidly. What does the road say? How does this fit in? And what's being the God of this by Hashem? The problem is that it's very hard to say what He's revealing to us because we don't have, we in, we're in the face of darkness, we don't have prophets to open our eyes and show us what the events mean. We, as far as we can see, they track very clearly the sequence of events that has been predicted. For example, many of our sources, most notably the Ramban, and then much more detailed the Reb Chaim Vital, right? Ramban writing in the 1200s, Chaim Vital writing, says that the final showdown will be in Israel. It will be the Western nations gathering together to, to attack us, but the point of attack will be the Arab nations. Right? There will be a partnership between them. I mean, the Rabbi has a long section on this in great deal. It was censored originally, but today in the new, the new printings, it's all put back. The Prime Vital says that the writing in the 1500s, he says that the final showdown will be an Arab, um, an Arab exile, which will be chaotic. It will be not an organized uh, Malthus, an organized sort of dominion. It will be a chaotic, uh, meaningless attacks all over the place, right? He bases it on verses. It will be crueler than any other. I mean, he goes into a lot of detail. <coughs> Writing in the 1500s where there was no Arab, <coughs> there was no Arab presence. There, was no, there, was, there were nomadic bands in, you know, in, the, in, the, in Saudi Arabia. So he, he spells that out in great detail. But we don't pretend to understand these things until they really unfold. We just don't have prophets to guide us anymore. So. Yes, please. So one of the reasons why I was looking forward to coming tonight was I've been working very hard on reaching my <coughs> potential spiritually. And I'm almost now I'm learning from you that maybe that's like the first phase, but the hardest part is staying there. It's so easy. You get your little classes that raise you and your books and you whatever, you learn and you're growing, but then it seems to me once I get there. It's just so hard to stay there, and I wanted to know if you had any advice on that. I use whiskey. <laughs>